Hi, we're the Misery Machine, and I'm Drewby, and this week is the finale of our ACS murders case. We will be discussing the arrest and some of the aftermath, but without further ado... The case of Christiana Fesmeyer, Part 3. So I want to preface before we start that a lot of this episode is going to be focused on details surrounding the people who were involved, and so because of that, I don't feel like we focus enough on Christiana. So I'd like to start this reading some of the things that Christiana's friends and family shared with me about Christiana. There wasn't many, but I still think it's important. Christiana was described as a loving, caring, trusting young lady that loved to dance. She's sorely missed by everyone. She was bold, brave, and beautiful. This one person writes that she was a loyal friend. She tried to take the time to be there for friends when they were in need. One time at a festival they were at, she called out an undercover cop she knew was there to try to protect her friends. She always wanted to make sure folks were safe. She was the life of the party, cracking jokes and always dancing the night away. She loved raves, festivals, and the community she found there loved her back. She enjoyed modeling as a hobby and had hauntingly gorgeous eyes. One of a kind person, never to be forgotten. Another person writes how they knew her growing up in grade school. She was a great friend. She loved to laugh. She loved music, loved art. She loved snowboarding. And she always had the biggest smile and was the life of the party. This person writes, who is actually the mother of her ex-fiance, Christiana dated my son and I knew and loved her very much. She was a kind, giving, sweet, beautiful, selfless, somewhat shy, gentle, and loving person. She had many friends and to know her was to love her. Having her stolen from her family and friends by that awful murderer is so unnerving. My friend Amber also wrote a poem about Christiana called Stolen Grace, which I will link in our comment section if you want to check it out. Yes, I think it should be watched, not just listened to. And it is very, very moving. So where we last left off, Detective Jim Thies of the Lewiston Police Department recovered Levi's Lexus that he had sold to another couple and confirmed that there were red and brown stains inside the trunk of the car consistent with that of human blood. After this, Detective Godbout of the Lewiston Police Department received documents from Rite Aid Pharmacy on Lisbon Street in Lewiston. Said documents show that a prescription was called in by Dr. Stephanie Ong on June 30th, 2011. Additional documents show Brock Poulin, who is the husband of Jacinta Labby, and then a friend to Christiana, whom she stayed with the both of them, purchasing the prescription from the same Rite Aid at 2.38 p.m. on July 1, 2011. Brock had earlier indicated that he had made the purchase of the prescription on the same day and spoke with Christiana following the purchase of it. So why is this important? So Brock was re-interviewed on September 21st at the Lewiston Police Department regarding these documents, the dates, the times, and everything that was received from Rite Aid. Brock advised that based on the time of the purchase of the prescription, he would have not been able to return home and arrive at his job at John F. Murphy Homes on time. Brock advised that he is never late and always arrives on or near 2.45 p.m. And based on the examination of these documents, Brock doubted that he had saw Christiana after receiving the prescription. So he had thought he had seen her that day. That's why this is important. And I just kind of want to note here, I I didn't want to release these folks' names. These folks, Jacinta and Brock, are nice people. And Christiana stayed with them for a period of time, correct? For a period of time, Jacinta was the person that reported her missing. And in reporting her missing, and based on the testimony that Brock gave, thinking that he might have saw her that day, the police put them through hell. Yeah, I mean, when you report someone missing, it is not uncommon, especially for small town police, to look at you first and put you through the ringer first. Thankfully, like, they were never named people of interest from what I understand. Not officially, but they gave them hell. They put them through hell, and it just wasn't fair. Like, I thought about possibly having pseudonyms for them. But I mean, if you go through the affidavits, which we have in the show notes anywhere, the first and last names names, are there. So it it has to be mentioned because it's part of the story. But at no point did we feel like that they were responsible or that they still had any Mm -hmm. responsibility. They don't, nor were they suspects. But this is what happened. This is where the police unfortunately focused. So then the police turned back to the people who this story has revolved around earlier. So upon examination of Buddy Robinson's cell phone records, 
it was discovered that a number of phone calls took place between Buddy and a woman named Crystal Brooks of Lewiston. These phone calls between Buddy and Crystal took place within the very time frame it is believed that Christiana's body was disposed of. So then a search warrant was issued of 688 Sabata Street in Lewiston. Now we mentioned that this was the house by Bork's Market that after they moved out of the Highland apartment where Christiana was killed, this is where they ended up moving into was 688 Sabata Street. So a search warrant was executed on September 23rd and Brandy was informed her Apple iPod was listed as an item in the warrant to be seized. She turned over her iPod as well as two Sprint cell phones. During the search, Detective Godbow asked Brandy for the laptop computer she had in her possession during the prior interview with him concerning this investigation. So where is this? She told the detective that she pawned it. She pawned it. So on September 26, the detective checked with the Lewiston Pawn Shop, which is located at 379 Lisbon Street in Lewiston. It's one of our most well-known pawn shops. I was going to say that it's, it's an all yellow building. We'll mm -hmm. put up pictures of it. Yeah. If you've been down Lisbon Street in Lewiston, you know exactly what we're talking I about. I bought my first guitar there. So the detective Godbout asked about computers that may have been pawned by Brandy or Buddy Robinson and Lewiston Pawn Shop produced documentation of a compact notebook computer and an Apple iTouch sold to their business by Buddy on July 28th and a Toshiba notebook computer sold by Buddy on August 23rd. The transaction amount for the three items was $250. The pawn shop turned over these items to Detective Godbout. Recovered from the search of 688 Sabata Street was a compact journal with Sergeant Robinson written in ink on the front cover. Do you know what Buddy's rank was by the time of was, his discharge? He was a sergeant and the really creepy thing about this is he brought this notebook to work with him all of the time. Oh, so you've seen this I've notebook. I've seen this notebook. Okay. He had it with him constantly. A handwritten entry to this journal contained 14 sequentially numbered paragraphs in talking point format. The following are excerpts from the portion of this journal. So these are all quotes, correct? Yes. From now on, I will say, quote, when we're done, I will end quote. Friends publicly said on Facebook that she was on his couch at 2.30 that afternoon parentheses brock comma jacinta close parentheses next line still no warrant she had been living there a month and a half she saw we would be gone plus she knew how to get in the house always high or drunk emotionally unstable would flip out then act like nothing happened no actual proof that i did anything she was a prostitute comma backpage.com if hiding something we would have cleaned the house after we left comma, and had full opportunity, would vanish days at a time. She would have cuts and bruises and say she fell, end quote. This is the end of the highlighted bullet points. So Detective Chris Tupper of the State Police obtained records from Walmart in Augusta, Maine. A receipt dated September 2nd from this Walmart location documents a purchase signed for by Brandy for a gallon of bleach, lighter fluid, paper towels, and air fresheners. A video recording that morning shows a white car pulling into the far end of the parking lot towing a U-Haul trailer, followed by a black car which pulled in beside it. On September 20th, Detective Godbout and Detective King paid a visit to 688 Sabata Street to interview Brandy. While there, Detective Godbout told Buddy that all he wanted to do was to find Christiana so he could tell the family what happened. Exasperated, Buddy then stated, quote, I'm so stressed out that I can't think straight. I can't remember where I put her, end quote. And this was the point where, allegedly, you had told me this off air, that the police weren't necessarily interested in Buddy that much, but now they became very interested on him based on this, this slip of the tongue. I don't think they knew really where to go with it until then. So on October 12th, Detective Godbout and Detective Layton re-interviewed Levi Gervais, he said Buddy primarily drove the black Lexus while Brandy primarily drove his white Cadillac. And he drove a third car, a Volvo. All these vehicles were registered in Levi's name. Levi said after returning the U-Haul trailer and picking up Buddy from work at ACS, he returned to 36 Island Avenue with Buddy and Brandy. Levi said he did not want any part in helping with the disposal of Christiana's body. He said Buddy was upset and made this statement. Quote, never mind, I'll take care of it myself, end quote. So at this point, he's perjured himself and made it known that he is aware of a murder taking place. Yes, keep that in mind. 
Levi said he was worried to the point of being physically sick and thought he might be next to be killed if he did not cooperate to help with the disposal of her body. Levi said he felt so ill he needed to go to the bathroom. While in the bathroom, he said he overheard a conversation between Buddy and Brandy. Buddy told Brandy he wrapped Christiana in a blanket and placed her in the inside of the trunk of the Lexus and then placed the Lexus in the garage. Levi heard Buddy say that the body smelled. Levi said that he walked outside, looked inside the garage, and he saw the Lexus inside. He said it was unusual for the Lexus to be inside of the garage as it was typically parked in the driveway. Levi said that Buddy left 36 Highland Avenue without the Lexus that he typically drove, which again, was still inside the garage. Levi said he remembered shopping at Walmart in Augusta the morning of July 2nd. He said Buddy picked up a gallon of bleach from the aisle as well as black ice air fresheners from the store, and Brandy purchased these items for him. He said he observed Buddy place one of the air fresheners inside the interior of the Lexus, and an air freshener inside the trunk of the Lexus. While the trunk was open, Levi said he observed a white blanket, which he recognized as one of the blankets from inside 36 Highland Avenue. Levi said after returning to Lewiston from Presque Isle, he and Brandy drove the Cadillac to a campground where they stayed for the holiday weekend. Buddy drove the Lexus to the campground. He said that he observed Buddy light a fire and over the course of a few hours, continue to throw items from the Lexus into the fire, including pieces of the white blanket. He said this was the same blanket that he was familiar with from inside 36 Highland Avenue and what he observed inside of the trunk of the Lexus at Walmart earlier that morning. Some sources say this was actually a gold blanket, but either way. It's alleged that was the blanket Christiana yes. was wrapped in. So this is where things take a really interesting turn. So should we kind of fill in the state of things um, at ACS the three months between then and now? what was going on in that period of time. I mean, you, you were kind of close to it. Buddy was still around. He was still working his shift. There were rumblings yeah. on the floor. There were some rumblings on the floor, but overall, aside from seeming a bit agitated and a little more jumpy than usual, things weren't totally that different yet. I want to make sure I'm remembering this correctly because I have very clear memories of what happened after Christiana was discovered. Yes. But prior to that, there was a mix of people thinking that she just ran away to go join the adult film industry. And it was a mix of the same crassness, remembering what happened to Donna Parody and being like, oh, this place just kills people. But other than that, there wasn't like pandemonium. The state of the floor hadn't changed yet from its usual self. And so three months pass, Christiana is still missing. There's no real headway being made until on October 12th, 2011, Brandy contacted Lewiston Police Department Detective Roland Godbout and requested to speak with him in lieu of having previously made contact with an attorney. Brandy advised Detective Godbout that she had questions concerning her and her son Michael. On October 13, 2011, Brandy came to the Lewiston Police Department and spoke with Detective Godbout and the Maine State Police Detective John Haney. Brandy advised that she had growing concerns about her brother Buddy. Brandy advised that Buddy had recently received medical treatment at St. Mary's Hospital for psychiatric care. Buddy had been showing signs of stress and had shown increased signs of fits of anger and rage. You can share something about this because yeah. you had mentioned to me the psychiatric care in question was Buddy committing himself yeah. to a mental hospital, correct? Correct. So I don't remember who it was that actually told me he was committed, but he had stopped coming to work. And this was odd for him because he never flat out missed work. It was always the going home early. And I believe it was either our receptionist who plays a part in this later or Brandy herself. Somebody let me know that he had committed himself. And you had no choice but to be forced into firing him at this point over his points, correct? Not quite yet. Okay. At that point, I tried my best to keep it off the books. And it wasn't until my boss finally asked, where is Buddy, that I had to tell her that he was a mental hospital. Let's give some perspective here. You might be wondering, well, how would an ops manager not notice that Buddy isn't showing up for work? We had in our campaign between, we were sister campaigns under the same umbrella, between my campaign and Yergi's campaign, we had over 100 agents on the floor and we were sitting next to a roadside assistance campaign that also had 
many people and we're all grouped together that it's very easy to overlook when somebody's not here. Now, of course, Buddy kind of stuck out like a sore thumb, but our ops manager had mm, a lot of things going on. And she often just stayed in her office. The unfortunate part about it was I had a desk right outside of her office. And a lot of times Buddy was sitting right at my desk with me. Mm -hmm. And that might have been the only reason she noticed. noticed it. But she did stay in her office all day and didn't really interact with people on the floor. So I'm not surprised it took as long as as long as it did mm -hmm. for her to notice. I mean... Back where I sat, which was on the other end of the building, if one of my agents was gone for a while, she didn't even notice. If one of my agents quit, which didn't happen, nobody quit under me during that period of time, but she wouldn't have noticed. So, And another really important thing that we should mention here is you really didn't, as a manager, want to fire your people because that looked bad on you. You had an attrition goal that you had to keep to stay under except, every single month. Except when we had orders to fire. Basically, right. if- But the it still counted line, against you. It did. It did. But our manager was not shy about doing that. Right. Unless you're talking about your attrition goal as so a supervisor. So my, my personal attrition goal as a supervisor, I don't remember what the percentage was, but I had to keep it under a certain amount or I looked really bad and it was held against me for losing people. If they didn't show up for work and I had to fire them, that was my fault for make, not making it a place where they wanted to come to work. Because under your membership retention campaign, they were killing for people. And I don't think there was any point at its lifetime where they're like, yeah, just fire a bunch of people. They, no. they were looking to hold on to everyone they could. Whereas in my campaign they would just randomly just get rid of 20, 30 people right. in one shot. So at this point, what my ops manager instructed me to do was to contact FMLA and try to file a claim for Buddy, which I did, and he was denied, mainly because nobody could get in touch with him he, in order to... He would to, have had to process some of the paperwork right. himself, as well as get some certs from doctors, if I'm correct. Right. Was he terminated before he made it out of the mental hospital? No. Okay. So he did end up returning to work. No, he did not. But he we'll get not. to that. Okay. Okay. So Brandy advised that on July 1st, she received a text message from Christiana, which stated that she was coming to 36 Highland Avenue. Brandy had planned to leave to do errands, and as she was backing out her vehicle from her driveway, Christiana arrived. Alonda had accompanied Brandy and was seated in the front passenger seat. Christiana advised that she wished to obtain her personal belongings. Brandy told Christiana that the Lexus keys were on the table and she was going to go get coffee. Remember, this is all Brandy's account to the police. Right. So Brandy stated that while she was in the drive through of Dunkin' Donuts in Lewiston, she received a call from Buddy via Christiana's phone, which we do know a call took place based on phone records. But we don't, as far as we know, the actual recording of the call was not obtained by police? Correct. Okay. So Buddy was upset and advised Brandy that he and Christiana had gotten into an argument and that Christiana had hit her head. But he also advised that Christiana had received a bloody nose. Brandy Robinson noted to the detective that the call was odd and drove to ACS where she and Alonda met with Levi. Brandy told Levi about Christiana bumping her head and receiving the nosebleed. Then she returned home to 36 Highland Avenue where Buddy told her not to go to the first floor. While speaking on the back porch, Buddy told Brandy that everything is okay and he is taking care of the trash. Again, this is all Brandy's testimony. We don't know 100% if these things happened or did not happen in the way in which she describes them. I just want to be clear about that. Brandy stated that she went outside to grab items from the Lexus. She observed a clothes hamper filled with Christiana's belongings in the back of the vehicle. Upon entering the vehicle, Brandy smelled a strong decaying odor. Is that even possible? I don't quickly? know that it's that possible because this happens in a matter of what, a half an hour to an hour. I can understand where maybe they had to get air fresheners the following day because Christiana had been left in a trunk in the hot summer sun and then put in a garage. I can understand that. This right here is her again perjuring herself. And from what we understand, we haven't quite gotten to this part yet, but there was a 15 minute window for Buddy to do what he did, correct? A, maybe a little bit more, but it didn't make sense. But I can get to that. Yes, but for decomposition and the smell of decomposition to happen this quickly, even in July, this does not make sense to me from a scientific level. Correct. Okay. 
Brandy stated that Buddy disclosed to her that Christiana had struck her head on the bathtub and that she had been placed in the trunk of the Lexus wrapped in a blanket and the apartment had been cleaned. Brandy noted that she had entered the first floor apartment and observed a blue mop bucket with a long haired mop. She described the bucket as containing copious amounts of red and brown stains. I'm assuming she means like red and brown water, to which Brandy described as blood. At that point in time, Brandy stated that she realized that Buddy was telling her the truth and Christiana was dead. Brandy stated that she went upstairs and vomited. She disclosed that later that day, Buddy told her that he was home alone in the second floor apartment and Christiana was downstairs speaking to her mother on the telephone. She then came upstairs and asked him a question regarding their mail. Buddy stated that Christiana was told that the mail was on the refrigerator. Allegedly, Christiana said, quote, that's weird. Buddy told Brandy that he hated when she said that, and an argument took place. The argument moved to the first floor apartment where he struck Christiana's head on the bathroom tub. Buddy stated to Brandy that she did not die easily. He had to fill up the bathroom tub with water and place Christiana into the tub. Buddy then sat on Christiana to submerge her. Buddy stated that he had wrapped Christiana in a gold comforter, again alluding to earlier there was a white blanket, a gold blanket, and placed her body into the trunk of the Lexus. Now, do we want to talk about the oddness of the manner of which she was killed, or do you want to uh, in a little bit? I mean, we can talk about it a little bit now. And we talk about this next episode, which is going to be kind of a special. It's like a special. It's a special addendum that you'll get. Hopefully next week it will be out from the release of this recording. It may be two weeks. We'll see. But we're intending to get it the week after. So Buddy was a huge guy. He is an ex-army vet. He was at least 6'3". If my memory serves he me correctly, he towered over me. He was huge. You He's know, I'm very a, strong. I'm a chunky little girl. He could pick me up with one arm and walk around. He is a big guy. He had big, giant arms. He saw combat. He has a body count. He has a purple heart. He was shot and stabbed. Yes. This is not somebody that needs to struggle very much to kill somebody like Christiana, who's who, tiny, who was a hundred, hundred and ten pounds. Somewhere between 90 and 110, if I recall correctly. I don't know her exact weight, but she's just so little. And she's very, very tiny. There there just wouldn't have been a struggle. Now, yes, can people in times of life or death channel this I- immense amount of strength and fight? Absolutely. But for him to smash her head and then have to forcibly hold her underwater to drown her to finish her off... This sounds like something that a smaller person would do or multiple smaller someones. The other thing that I want to mention is the manner of which a large man is killing a smaller woman. It's usually not done in this manner. It's usually strangulation. It's usually strangulation. Now, there's other things. If using a weapon, a stabbing is quite common. Guns. Uh, Guns. Maybe they get beat to death. In some absolute overkill scenario, I I hate to be so graphic, but the the man is just hitting over and over in some crime of passion kind of way. It is not like this. And that was the biggest red flag to me when this was described to me. It's like, he did it how? It doesn't make sense in the way in which, and remember, this is all from Brandy's testimony. This is the only thing we have on this, if I'm correct. This is correct. And this is not defending buddy this is not defending anybody we're just pointing out how odd this is there's two things that are odd already that we've stated one is the small amount of time that buddy could have done this and we'll get into that further in a little bit two is the manner of death and i guess third is that he did this during a time where your time card said he was at work with you so yeah we'll get to this now i don't know if i talked about this a little bit last episode we did so because we mentioned buddy's lawyer right So according to the affidavit, where we're getting a lot of this information from, he said he worked from 1130 in the morning to eight o'clock at night, which is when our campaign closed. Now, I would bet my life savings that that is not correct, because like I had said, I had checked time clock records that day, and it specifically stated that he had punched in at eight o'clock in the morning. And if I didn't have that type of evidence, there would have been no way I would have screenshotted that 
risked my job to then send that to his lawyer without any sort of warrant. You were almost fired. I was. They had human resources come in from out of state. Fly in. Fly in to give me my final warning. And I don't know why they didn't fire me. And I really do not know why I wasn't fired for this. The lawyer didn't even keep it in confidence. He went and immediately contacted your boss to ask for more. Yeah. Correct? You were strung up and hung to dry. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that you were not fired. So to take this big yeah. of a risk to protect somebody you cared about, you wouldn't have done that willy-nilly. No, absolutely not. If I didn't think... And we get into the, a lot of this. Like, I don't know how much I want to share and spoil because there's so much we get into when we have the episode that we have coming up. But let's just say like I really, really felt like injustices were being done and that I was the only person who could help. Brandy further noted that after Buddy returned from work, he took the Lexus from the garage and drove to dispose of Christiana's body at an unknown location. He told Brandy that he parked the Lexus on a paved main road and carried Christiana's body two miles out and turned left for two clicks, clicks are military kilometers, into a swampy area. Buddy stated that he vomited twice while carrying her body. The following day, Brandy, Buddy, Levi, and Michael went camping at the KOA campground located in Richmond, Maine. At the campground, Brandy stated that Buddy was seen with a kitchen knife and the gold comforter. So the gold comforter, the white comforter, people are misremembering what color this is, but it's the same comforter. Buddy had cut the comforter into small pieces and was burning them in the campfire. Brandy advised that the fire was getting so large that an employee stopped at the campsite and advised Buddy to control it. Brandy advised investigators that she had attempted several times to speak to Buddy about disclosing the incident to police and to the whereabouts of Christiana's body, and that Buddy would become angry and irate when discussing the incident. So this is why Buddy never returned to work. So on October 14th, Buddy was arrested while at his girlfriend Kimmy's house in New Gloucester. The two of these folks had met in the psych ward over at St. Mary's Hospital. Buddy was transported to the Cumberland County Jail in Portland due to the fact that his brother worked as a guard at the Androscoggin County Jail. All parties involved with the prostitution ring were granted full immunity in exchange for their cooperation and testimony against Buddy Robinson. And not just full immunity from prostitution charges. We're talking full immunity for accessory to murder or anything related to a murder charge. Right. The, this is something you don't hear of that often. This is done usually to get a high profile person for somebody to roll to get somebody they've been really wanting to get and there's no other way to get them. It is not done for these people who just are basically insignificant. It was never officially stated that they were given immunity from accessory to murder, but they were never charged with it or even had it pursued. So for the remainder of this podcast episode, I'm going to define that as immunity. Whether that's legally correct or not is... They never went for me. another suspect. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a legal professional. Neither of us are. But from my understanding, they could have pursued accessory to murder on maybe all of them. So I'm just going to talk about it as they had immunity. But legally, what was on the books is they were given immunity to the prostitution charges. In my mind, they were given immunity to so much more. And the last day I saw Buddy. You saw him on October 13th. That was the very last day you saw him, correct? I believe that was the day. So he had gotten out of the psych ward. And I believe he had texted me or someone told me he was out. And I'm like, do you want to get coffee, Buddy? So we went to the Dunkin' Donuts on Lisbon Street and got some coffee and we proceeded to just drive around. It was late at night. And the thing that I had remembered is I went to go pick him up at the house, but he wasn't at the house. He was hiding behind Bork's Market and just peeking around the corner waiting for me because he was so afraid that the cops were coming to pick him up. So we just drove and I just drove on some back roads and we talked and I don't even remember what we talked about. I really, really don't. And I really felt like this is probably the last time I was going to see him. Why do you feel like it was the last time you were going to see I him? I just felt a certain way that it was just going to be the last time. And we were driving down a back road, kind of where like the butcher shop we go is. It's on, in Wales. It's in Wales called Leeds Junction Road. And 
two police officers had a car pulled over, but because there's really no lights out there, all you could see was blue ahead of us. And Buddy went silent for a moment and kind of like freaked out and panicked like a deer in the headlights, started having like a PTSD moment. I wonder if he thought you were turning him over and that this was a pickup spot because we have to really stress this road where they were driving on is not well-traveled, especially at night. So to see something like this, especially if you see two cop cars there, something's going on. Right. So I could understand why he kind of freaked out there. Yeah. I was just doing this loop that I normally do when I'm just driving aimlessly. But yeah, we saw some police and he kind of freaked out a little bit. So I ended up dropping him back off over at Bork's, gave him a hug, kiss on the cheek, said goodbye. And that was the last time I saw him outside of jail. Levi testified that he overheard Brandy and Buddy talking shortly before the three of them took a trip to Presque Isle. Levi said he was in Brandy's bedroom at her 36 Highland Avenue home when he overheard her talking to Buddy who said, It's been in the trunk all day. Just let me get it done. Later that day, while at work at ACS, Buddy asked him if, quote, the trash had been taken care of, end quote. After hearing brother and sister discussing the matter at their apartment that night, Levi said that his stomach instantly turned when he realized the implications, then rushed to the bathroom. He stated that he had smoked a lot of marijuana earlier in the day to help him cope with the events. When asked about Christiana's relationship with the Robinson siblings... Alanda said, quote, they appeared to not like her, end quote. She said that Brandy had told her that they had a hard time getting Christiana to pull together the rest of her belongings and to move out. At one time, Brandy had vented to her about getting beaten up by Christiana. She also told her that Christiana attacked her son, Michael. Alanda said that Brandy seemed to control Buddy. Quote, at school, he was big and tough, but a very sweet man. With his sister, she told him what to do, end quote. It just seemed odd. And this is not the first time I had heard this. I haven't gotten really permission to give this person's name out, but they told me that this was something that went on a lot in their past. They had went to high school with them, but this was something that they had seen in the past too, where Brandy controlled Buddy. And he would just do whatever she would say or ask of him. Now, the time when Brandy supposedly got beat up by Christiana, I, I know they got into a fight in Boston and Christiana bit her finger. Brandy testified that she began working as an escort during the summer of 2010. By Christmas, she had started her own business, recruiting three women, including Christiana, to work for her that winter and spring, though allegedly there were more women than this. Brandy said that she kept 40% of her escort's earnings while the escorts retained 60%. Brandy said Christiana became more active in the business after breaking up with her boyfriend. Now, that's her own testimony because we have some conflicting information on that that I'm just about to get to. In the late spring of 2011, Christiana allegedly quit working after allegedly contracting a sexually transmitted infection. Brandy said she and Christiana got along fine despite a fight one night during an overnight escort trip in Massachusetts. She said Christiana was emotionally overwrought about the suicide of a friend, which was her ex-boyfriend, and she drank too much. According to Brandy, Christiana threw her cell phone at her and bit her finger, but they reconciled. Although she implicated Buddy, which helped lead to his murder charge, Brandy testified that she loved her twin brother and was not happy about having to testify against him. She said that Buddy, who had a close relationship with her son Michael, had shared a bedroom with him, and was angry when Christiana disciplined the boy by hitting him in the back of the head while she was babysitting him. Buddy was also miffed that Christiana had once left Michael alone while she was supposed to be watching him. A Lewiston Police Department detective acknowledged under cross-examination that he had characterized Brandy Robinson as, quote, a chronic liar. Buddy was convicted of Christiana's murder. He was convicted with a thin to no motive. I believe the motive was jealousy even though police did not... It was jealousy and the fact that he thought that Christiana was hitting Michael and based off Brandy's testimony saying that he snapped because she said, that's weird. So kind of a thin motive. I know some folks were like, you haven't explained a motive. Well, this is the motive and it's not much. And there was no body. He was convicted of murder. With no body. With no body found. 
he was convicted off the testimony of basically three other key witnesses that were given immunity to the murder charges and Correct. to the prostitution ring charges. Mm -hmm. And at this time, you were made state's witness. Me and a lot of other people were made state's witness. So anybody that worked with Buddy closely or had written to him or had called him or visited him in the county jail all got made state's witnesses. And it was really bad. It was really bad. Thankfully, I never actually had to go to court for this, but I believe some of my agents did. I kind of wish that you had based on the information that you had, because I don't think the time clock records were ever brought to the court's attention because Buddy's lawyer mis so inept. mishandled this so profoundly. So above and beyond that, the DA that was handling this, Andrew Benson, who's now a judge, he, what a slimy figure he was. He had gotten in trouble and it actually caused an appeal for Buddy, even though it, you know, he didn't get a new trial. So I spoke with somebody who is a former lawyer. What he told me after reviewing some of the affidavits, he told me some stuff that I think would be hard to communicate as a layman. But one thing that I felt was pretty understandable regarding Buddy's case is that what's working against him is that some of the things he's arguing that robbed him of his chance at a fair trial were not even objected to at the time they were happening in the courtroom. If you don't ask the judge to do something about it at the time it's happening, the appellate court doesn't feel that you have properly preserved the error for appeal. In other words, if they had asked the judge to do something about it, maybe they would have taken action and corrected it. If you don't ask, how can you say the judge made a mistake by not doing something about it? So without that objection, the court is now looking at whether these instances of prosecutorial misconduct so obviously made the trial unfair to Buddy that the court should have done something even without the objections from Buddy's lawyer, and the failing to do so affected the outcome of the proceeding. In other words, the law court would need to find that Buddy would have likely been found not guilty without the judge correcting the misconduct in question that Buddy's lawyer failed to object to. That makes the standard of review really hard to meet. Another thing that he mentioned was that the law court felt the evidence against him was so strong that essentially, even though the prosecutor acting in a way that was, quote, without, and this is a quote from the affidavit, you can read it. They characterized the prosecutor, which I believe was uh, the DA, Andrew Benson, correct? Yes. Quote, without question, sophomoric, unprofessional, and a poor reflection on the prosecutor's office, end quote. Like, they literally characterized him as that in the affidavit. But even with that in mind, it still didn't rise to the level of impacting the outcome of the trial. Because they felt that the evidence against Buddy was just so strong. So what does this mean? Like, what are we trying to say? If Buddy's lawyer objected to the fact that the DA was mouthing he did it and things like that, could he have gotten a new trial? Maybe. But as it stands right now, this is really hurting his appeals. It's really hurting his ability to appeal it because his lawyer didn't object to it when it was happening. And this is why it's important to get proper representation. And this is why when people have public defenders, not saying that this guy was a public defender, but in general, why when people have public defenders, they don't end up beating their cases. You get what you pay for, unfortunately, and a lot of people don't have the money to afford such things. So another thing that I should mention, we're recording this as an addendum after the fact that I'm going to slide in here, just kind of a little behind the scenes thing, because I felt like this needed to be explained a little bit further. We mentioned at some point in this episode to stress that Buddy didn't seem to have any involvement with the prostitution business. He, he admitted as such to Yergi, and whether you believe that is true or not, he never really had any money and showed no signs of having money. Here's another thing that could be evidence to why he wasn't involved with the business, because if he was involved in such a business that made such money like this, he could have afforded a very good lawyer, not somebody at the time I'm pretty sure only did family law. There's some good criminal defense attorneys around here that um, I, I can think of one in particular. I can think of two right off the top of my head that, that would have been amazing to, to defend him. That, that have beaten cases for their clients that they probably should have been convicted for. If Buddy had money, he could have afforded those people easily. And, and here's the thing with it as well. If people wanted him out of jail, i.e. Brandy with the money that she was making with this prostitution ring, she could have got him a proper lawyer. Easily. But she didn't. Easily. 
I don't think at this part of the episode we exactly explain why that might be, but we'll get to that. Yeah, so basically what was happening was Benson, who is now a judge now, he was the DA then, was mouthing to the jury, he did it. He he just sucked because like I got pulled into interviews about how things were going to go at court, even though I didn't end up having to go to court with him and Detective Layton. So I've met Detective Layton and spoke with him many times on the phone. How was Detective Layton to deal with? He was a nice guy. He generally was like a decent guy. He wasn't trying to pressure me into anything and was courteous to me. But after they briefed me, I was leaving the room and Detective Benson was like, excuse me, District Attorney Benson was like, you know, he has tons of other girlfriends as well. It's not just you. And it's like, what do I care I, to, to be clear to everybody, I'm sure there's some people that assume this, like you were not in any sort of relationship with Buddy. No. Apart from friends, like there was no, he was there was nothing like, sexual. There was nothing, nothing like sexual, that. I know a lot of romantic people... or anything. He was just a good friend of mine that I trusted at work. And I don't say this lightly, but trusted with my life. And I thought a lot of. I actually wanted my sister to date him because I thought he was such a nice guy. And they tried pulling that on me. Now, is that true? Yeah, a lot of girls were writing to Buddy in prison. A lot of them. There were times where I would show up to visit him at the Cumberland County Jail and there were other people that had showed up there an hour earlier to bump me out of the spot because you could only have two visitors. And to use something like that just to get people to get mad and say whatever, because it's not a matter of are you saying what's truthful or what's not. Are you going to say what's going to get the conviction? And they wanted Buddy. It yeah. really seems like they wanted Buddy. They wanted Buddy, and I wasn't going to give them anything that would give them Buddy. So they didn't call me. Like, I had to basically be on call and have my phone right next to me. At all times. At all times during that trial, because I needed to be there if they called on me. I know we're not going to give names of, like, some of your coworkers that went to trial, mm -hmm. but are you able to share their experiences with having to go on the stand for that? They never gave me information. Okay. They never told me. Okay. And I've contacted some of them about this, and they didn't respond. Remember, nobody wants to talk with us about it. Very few people talked about this. People just want this to go away. But if you think that we're alluding that Buddy is innocent... Wait till we read this next part. So on December 4th, 2012, remains were found off of a popular ATV and snowmobile trail near the Left Hand Club in Lisbon, Maine, after receiving a tip. This is an area I've been many times in my life. It's right where I grew up. Now, who did this tip come from? Buddy. Buddy Robinson. On December 12th, DNA analysis confirmed that the remains did indeed belong to Christiana, and the cause and manner of death were homicidal violence with facial fractures. Now, he gave this tip at sentencing. At sentencing. So at his sentence hearing on October 18th, 2013, Buddy apologized for withholding for months where he had dumped Christiana's body. But he didn't apologize for her death. We should be clear, he maintains his innocence he on does. the killing. Justice Mary Gay Kennedy scolded Buddy for failing to take responsibility for the brutal and vicious killing of Christiana Fesmeyer and said his apology didn't ring true for her. Buddy was sentenced to serve 55 years in the Maine State Prison in Warren, where he is currently a member of Canine Corrections. He is a volunteer in the prison's hospice program holding vigil over dying inmates. He's a math tutor for inmates seeking their GEDs, and he's hopefully doing things in there to like do better and you've spoken to him a few times yeah through letters since mm -hmm. then so no it's just hard it's just hard because like this was like you know i don't want to spoil too much for the special that we have because well we should at least cover it here just yeah. in case things aren't covered like let's yeah people it's want just, to hear this from it's us it's so freaking hard because I like put like people hated me at work after this. I almost lost my job. I lost so many of my friends. So many people lost respect for me. People were sitting there saying that I wanted Christiana dead and I was happy. And that's not even, she was such a nice person. Like I, I never wanted anything like that. And like, I really honestly thought like some sort of injustice was being done and that I had to do everything I could to try to get the right person in, in jail. And I thought it was Brandy. I thought, I still kind of feel like it, it's Brandy. And it, it just sucks because all throughout his trial, I was, I was 
championing his cause because I thought I was the only person who could prove he was innocent through those time clock records and nobody was listening to me at all. And then when he gave up the location of her body, like it really, really, I can't even like kind of describe what that does. Like how like betrayed I felt. And I'm not trying to make this about me. I'm not. It's just like what a complete like mind this whole thing is and i'm sorry for swearing but that's like what it is i mean people wanted to hear our personal opinions and our experience they've been asking for it they're like but you've been talking about the facts you haven't really talked about your personal experiences so like when it's when it's when it's someone you like care about like that like this was like you know a friend of mine a very trusted colleague and then this happens and you realize you've been lied to you realize you've been lied to like why not just say where her body is like why do this he, despite knowing where the body is, maintains his innocence of the murder. Now, when you've talked to him through letters, he said that because he has an appeal or is preparing appeal, still pre- appealing as a case, has appeals left, he cannot talk too much about that. Right. So I'm assuming that the angle he's trying to like go on is mm-hmm. that Brandy did the kill right. or, so- or Brandy and someone else. And that he just disposed of the body. Right. At trial, he, you know, tried to make her an alternative suspect. But it was like too little too late at that point. It had gone too far. The The trial had already been botched in many ways. He has a new lawyer now, from what I understand. Right. Um, his original lawyer, I believe at the time, only did family law. He now lists himself as a criminal defense lawyer. But at the time... Yeah, he does like accident type stuff as well but he wasn't known to be a criminal defense kind of guy at least wasn't one like maybe criminal defense if you were caught drunk driving not in a murder charge yeah i mean that's a huge huge case there's not many lawyers in this area that handle murder charges one because it just doesn't come up that often he had really bad representation in my opinion he did and could that have cost him here it absolutely could have the question here is not was buddy robinson innocent of all wrongdoing it's did buddy robinson commit the murder and we still don't i don't care what anyone says we still don't have full evidence on that we really don't all we have is a thin motive and the testimony of three other people that did not witness it happen like i really feel like for me what's important is if if Christiana's is getting justice and there's no way she is no way we've got people that should be locked up running free at this point Maybe Buddy's supposed to be locked up for Christiana to have justice. Sure, absolutely. Any but not complete justice. But not complete. Because what if her murderer is still walking free? And honestly, for his involvement, she, yeah, he absolutely should do time. He absolutely should do time. But so should the others. Yes. I mean, to think that there were other people that may have helped move the body or allowed the usage of their vehicle so somebody could transport said body in the very least... That's accessory, is it not? It is accessory. Neither of us are legal professionals, but from my personal understanding, that's accessory. And there should be charges with that as well. Whether or not Levi Gervais knew and was involved here, he claims he had no idea there was a prostitution ring. At first, didn't claim that he had no idea there was a murder that happened. And then claimed he found out afterwards and that knew the body was being transported. He's now somebody in local politics. Yes. Yeah, so he was should, not charged at all. We should probably get into, you know, what about the others? So, you know, after Buddy's trial, Brandy Robinson and her son Michael and their mother moved to Texas. It's not clear, however, if they're still there or not, because as someone actually mentioned in the comments who decided to like look into this further, I'm glad you did. Brandy has vanished from social media. Her, she may have changed her name. She may have changed her ma- name. The only way I found pictures was digging really deep. I won't say whose page they're on, but I, that's the only way I found pictures of her was through somebody else's Facebook page. She's vanished from the internet completely. So Levi Gervais rekindled his relationship with the mother of his child. Which is not Brandy. Which is not Brandy and became very active in local politics in Auburn, Maine. So it was very strange because I went to go vote at my old voting place where I used to live in Auburn. And there's Levi there. There's actually articles in our local newspaper, The Sun Journal, that I have linked in our source information. If you're, you know, looking at this on YouTube or even even in the podcast platforms, you have access to it. 
But him basically stating that like Brandy had seduced him and put him in this whole like drug fueled. I don't even know how to explain this, but basically had manipulated him into this weird lifestyle. He described himself as an abuse victim. Yeah. Let me tell you something about my perspective. Now, I didn't work directly with Levi, though his pod was close to me where I sat through a portion of my stay where I was. And what I saw, and now this is just what I saw in my opinion, okay? He was somebody who was very charismatic, was very good with women. He constantly had many younger women at his desk that he appeared flirtatious with. There was rumors that, you know, he just had a lot of girls. And this just never, my brief interactions with him and other people who have talked about Levi, he never seemed like somebody who could be taken advantage of. He was always somebody who's very in control. People described him to me as a master manipulator himself. I have heard that as well. So to hear a charismatic master manipulator who is just very in control of all of his interactions and everything that he does to be taken advantage of in this way seems hard for me to believe. So he is also heavily involved with bowling and children's league. So it's very, very strange. I'm glad you got your second chance and turned it around, but... Yeah, maybe you got it. So, okay. I can see, possibly, that maybe you were in too deep, and then this happened, and you panicked, and you didn't know what to do, and so you helped to get rid of the body, or you were... Or at least compl- perjured yourself. Or, you perjured or, or, yourself. Or you were complicit in knowing that it happened and, and failed to report it in a timely manner, and you regret that. You regret ever being a part of this. Maybe you don't regret being a part of a prostitution ring because, you know good business or what have you. But when it got to murder, you didn't think this was going to happen and you bit off more than you could chew. I could see that happening. There are people out there that aren't good people, but they're not murderers. All right. And they're not people who are complicit or approve of murder. That could absolutely be Levi. And he just happened to get real lucky to not be in prison over being a part of this. You know, I'm, I don't hate him for the fact, I don't hate him anyway, but like my specific issue with this is I just don't feel like he's taking responsibility for his part in this. Like you're not some sort of abuse victim here. You played a crucial role in this. Someone reached out to me, like we, we said before, we were looking for information about this. We reached out on social media to people to give their either thoughts about Christiana, their time on the call floor. Very few people reached out, but... Someone did. Someone did actually yesterday. They had stated that they were in a training class with Levi for his campaign. And he had asked if they were a quick typer. And if they were, he had a medical transcription business he could suggest for them. That is not the first time I have heard that Levi was recruiting girls for this. Now, again, this is alleged. Nothing was proven, but I have heard that as well. Another thing that should be pointed out that you said to me off air regarding Levi is that if he felt like he was next or if that he was in danger, he had ample time to that day report everything to the police, correct? Absolutely. So you'll remember in our previous episode, we talk about the fact that Levi went home on his lunch break, found out that the murder had taken place and then went back to work. At that point, he had ample opportunity to go ahead and, you know, tell a fellow manager, call the police, do something about it. And from your recollection, (laughs) Buddy never left work. He never left work. So, hey, if there is a problem, why not say say something to me? I'm his manager. Or just call the police from your place of work. There's so many people around you. It's not like you're going to get killed on the call floor. Right. There was time. So, I mean, this doesn't ring true to me, Levi. And again, only like Brandy said that there were three girls underneath her in her prostitution business. That is not what I've heard. I heard that it was many more than that. There were girls coming from ACS to work with her and that all of the girls working for her were not all based in Maine. This was smoothed over. And as we said in episode one, there were people allegedly have no proof of this that were high up in politics, not just in Maine, but in other states that were patrons of this business. So it is quite possible that they wanted this to be open and shut very quickly 
Because if they were to try all of them, as they should have, in my opinion, maybe people would be willing to give up the names of these high-profile people in order to get out of it. And what's better to protect in the end of the day? Do we want to ruin all these politicians? Think, think of it if you're the DA. Think of this if you're the police. Do you really want this to happen? Maybe, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't know. But it's quite strange to me that they would give immunity to this many people if they did not have a huge thing to protect. And hey, do you, do you want to go to prison or not? If you keep your mouth shut, on who you serviced, you can go free. Do you want to keep your son? Keep your mouth shut. Exactly. Like, who who wouldn't take that deal? I would take that deal. Who ever gets a second chance on murder? Who gets a second chance on that? And when I say murder, I'm not saying that they all murdered Christiana. I'm not saying they all did that. I'm saying they were all surrounding it. They all perjured themselves as having knowledge and failing to, in the very least, they had knowledge and they failed to report it. And then you have the really suspicious motive in the very suspicious manner of death. Again, we said this before. From your knowledge, Buddy was not working in this business. He was not uh, wrangling patrons. He was not recruiting girls. He was not receiving any money from Brandy right. over this. He had very little money. The only money he had was from ACS. He lived a very simple life. None of those cars were his. You never he dressed saw him, very plainly. You never saw him flash money. You no. never saw him make expensive purchases. He never had no. anything that looked like he had means of that sort. No. He just simply lived with his twin sister, whom it appears that he cared about very much. Yeah, he lived a very, very simple life. So based on what we said earlier, is it possible that he would have done anything she asked of him? due to sheer loyalty yeah absolutely is the thing that was asked of him murder or was it simply disposing of the body is it even as far as taking the rap so that way a mother still is there for her child i don't know this is pure speculation the one thing that i really regret was not emailing that time card to myself at home yeah because now you don't have it and, and his lawyer either doesn't have it anymore or, or won't give me. it to you yeah he won't respond yurgi did reach out to him and he just ghosted it's my personal opinion. He doesn't have a record of that anymore. He probably doesn't. And he probably doesn't like that Buddy fired him. And he probably doesn't like the fact that I wouldn't tell him what Detective Layton was saying. Like, it was so bad. Detective Layton would call me and then an hour would go by and his lawyer would call me and wanted to know what they said, but I wouldn't give any info. Is that like, does that like indict I don't, you for crime? I don't think it would indict me for anything because like I openly let Detective Layton know that was going on because I felt really uncomfortable about that. Like, yeah, you know, honestly, I would too. Cause I mean, you don't know where you're at, like legally, like you no. don't know if you're going to accidentally step somewhere where you're, you're committing a crime and not right. realizing it because you don't understand the legal system, which plenty right. of people don't. And Detective Layton was like, I really, really, you know, would appreciate if you did not provide my, my strategy to him. And I told him I wouldn't, that I wouldn't do it. Like, I don't want to get myself in trouble. I hadn't done anything wrong. I was just trying to like champion a cause for my friend that I thought was completely innocent at the time. Did you mention the time card thing to Detective Layton? Yes. And what did he say about nothing. it? Nothing. He just like pretended like, yeah, whatever. Uh, he like would, nothing, he was, no like to do was made of it. I don't remember the specifics, excuse me, because this has been over a decade. You, and You provided a solid alibi yeah. for their chief suspect, a man who is now convicted and it wasn't even entertained nor look into. They didn't subpoena ACS for their records they at they least that nothing. i do not know of okay yes. i mean there could have been a subpoena you, you think that would be in the affidavit though right but nothing like i've gone through some affidavits here there was one that was made public that you can find on fine law and then there's the 16 page one where we got a lot of information and we have both of those in the show notes right and in the but you know, nowhere does it say any of the information that acs provided you would think that that would be made public as it relates to the case i i just don't know that's very strange to me it's like they didn't want to go down that route because imagine nobody barely any motive and then an airtight alibi you're convicting someone on what now? Mm -hmm. They just don't want that there. And especially at the end of the day, the police have a strategy. Like you said, he had a strategy. That strategy is not to uphold justice or necessarily even uphold the law. Right. It's to get a conviction. I remember one time in a letter that Buddy had written to me, and I wish I still had some of these letters. He basically stated that it's not like crime shows that you watch on TV where you know, they get all the evidence and they go and arrest the suspect with, you know, the loot, the warrant, whatever, kind of like Carmen Sandiego. It's not like that. 
what they do is they figure out who they want as a suspect and then try to make their evidence fit that person. I remember reading that too off part of the letter you showed me. Yeah. And you would think that this would be a well-known case, a case that people remember and still talk about. People remember. A lot of people don't know about it like you think they'd know about it. And since this period of time, both of Christiana's parents are now deceased. deceased. She's buried with them in the same plot of land in, in Lincoln, in Lincoln, Maine. Yep. And that's it. She doesn't have much in the way of surviving relatives. Uh, her friends, there's a small remembrance Facebook group for her. Yeah, there's two of them. She has her, her brothers and sisters, but it's really hard, especially with that, that circle of friends that she partied with. A lot of people are dying now. Yeah. A lot of people are dying now that, you know, drugs have gotten really unsafe. And this was just hard to cover to an extensive period. Most people would only talk to me. And the reason is when you covered this case before, it was much shorter on a previous podcast. Mm -hmm. This was like three years ago. A lot of people were upset with you for that. A lot of people were upset, although there were some people that acknowledged that I had done a good job. A lot of people were upset. A lot of people still seem to think that I harbor some sort of resentment for Christiana and wanted her dead. And it's just because you were friends with Buddy. And it's just because I was friends with Buddy. And tried to prove his innocence. Um, or you felt his innocence. I'm not, again, yeah. this is not a statement that Buddy is innocent. I mean, think about it. Like, think about this for a second. A friend of yours, a family member, gets accused of something so horrendous as murder, and you have proof that possibly they didn't do it, or it just didn't fit. What would you do? Based on the time period. What would you do? Yeah. What would you, what would you do? Would you really let them, and you know what's sick? Some people would. Some people just don't want to trouble themselves. Well, some people would not stick their neck out even knowing that it's 100% the right thing to do. And you did the right thing mm -hmm. based on the information you had. I probably was the most moral person in all of this. Yeah. yeah. The only thing that I really regret, and I mentioned this you know, later in our special, is that I brought other people into it. If I wanted to champion this, like that was my own thing. But like I dragged, you know, my team into what my thought process was. And that, you know, wasn't right. Do you think Buddy Robinson murdered Christiana Fesmeyer? No. No, I don't. Do I think that he hit her body? Absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely do. I, I agree. I mean, there's no way he would have known. I don't think known. he did. He was able to lead them to the exact location. Mm -hmm. He he knew. He yeah. he hid her body 100%. I have no doubts about that. Yeah. But if you were to put a gun to my head, I don't believe he killed her. I just don't. It just doesn't look like... We, we've been covering cases for how long now? This is one of the cases we absolutely wanted to talk about. And in our original ACS episode that we did that was like six hours yeah. long, we talked about this case. And one of the things that was hard for us was, do we even want to cover this case? There's so much here. How are we going to unpack this and do Christiana justice? Mm -hmm. Now that we've been podcasters for over two years now, I feel like we had the ability to do it, the ability to communicate it. And to put this in a digestible manner, because we've been talking, I mean, I haven't edited this, but we're at uh, an hour and 11 minutes of just raw talk time for this one episode. And so when you ask, why didn't we make this a single episode? We could have gone for three you hours. Can't, you can't make this into a single episode. I you mean, can't. I mean, this is longer. This one episode here is longer than most of our episodes. And now I'm at a point where... I could go for another 45 mm -hmm. minutes because I don't know what to do here, Yergi. Do we end on this note or do I talk about the state of ACS after that or do we make that its own episode? So I think it's its its own episode. Like we talked about before, we have like six hours of uncut footage of us talking about this. The next episode that we talk about with this, we have a special guest. We talk about some of the other things that happened at ACS. We talk about Donna Parody's murder. We talk about Christiana's murder and we go on for over two hours. We cover a lot. Do I think there's other things that I could have mentioned that I forgot about? Absolutely. And maybe mm -hmm. you want to hear its own episode about what happened. What was the fallout at ACS after Christiana Fesmeyer was found to be murdered and Buddy was convicted? I'll tell you, it it was I it was something. It was insane. It was crazy. It was it was um, if you want to hear this, let us know. If you've listened this far, please send us an email, miserymachinepodcast at gmail.com. Or if you're listening on YouTube, please leave a comment if you want to hear this. Now, hopefully next week this will be out. We have a special interview with Vin from Vin and Sori. They are a big YouTube channel. 
they mainly do music reviews. Vin was our boss, our boss, not our boss. And this campaign that we were talked about, he was our former ops manager. We were on the same financial services campaign with him before we were moved over. And so, he was Donna Parody's direct supervisor. And, and he was Donna Parody's direct supervisor before he became an operations manager. He has a lot of good information to share. He has a lot of information from behind the scenes in the call center world, what was going on in upper management. Excuse me, he was Richard Dwyer's supervisor. Oh, he's Richard Dwyer, yes. yes but but, but was he was on, on the same campaign, the campaign as Donna Parody. It is going to be a pure video interview. So that's going to be a first for us. Mm -hmm. It came out very well. I cannot wait for you all to see it. And I'm sorry for being emotional, but this is very hard. There's still so much we can say. I can go on about just what the floor was. I'll, I'll tell you this much. Again, if you want to hear about this, let us know. But I'll tell you this much about the floor. This sent people just into pure insanity. Like imagine that whole like laughing hysterically because you're descending into madness. That was what the floor was. People could not believe another murder took place here. And that not only that, they weren't safe. They weren't safe in their jobs. They weren't safe in their pay. Like we could be cut any minute. The client could pull the campaign at any minute. It was just obvious that none of our lives mattered, no matter what your level was. There was a high turnover rate. People would get fired like that. And on top of that, your life isn't safe. You could just get murdered and here. Nor, nor does it matter to the powers that be. Because they, they wouldn't do anything. They just cared about protecting their own. And we, we had this like, ho-hum, police come in. Well, you know, if somebody's going to kill you, they're going to kill you. Uh, that's literally what they said. And it just people found it. Their way of coping with it was humor. It was hilarious to people. It, this was this was not like Donna Parody was like, oh my God, like, what are we going to do? Like, is this safe? Like, how do we move forward from here? And then Christiana was, nobody cares about us. Isn't this so funny? Isn't this so funny that we could die any moment and no one would do a damn thing about us? And look, we were right about it. We were right because 10 years later, do you even hear about Christiana anymore? No, you don't. You don't hear anything about this. There's no justice. There's no nothing. People don't want to talk about it. They all got away with it. And when I say they, I just don't mean like the people we talked about. I mean, ACS kind of got away with, in my opinion, not disclosing more things, not lending themselves transparency that we know of to the investigation, not helping out like they did this with Donna. They just wanted to close up. And when we were told, when this was made public, we were all brought into rooms and we we're told, if you talk about this on the floor, you're fired. If you talk about with the media outside, you are fired. And we had reporters outside of the building trying to flag us down, trying to talk to us. And if we said one word to them, we were fired, fired immediately. I will say the one good thing was crisis never ratted me out because I went in there like I was some sort of revolutionary being like, I'm not going to talk about this. I want to talk about how ACS won't let us talk. And they never ratted me out. Who was crisis? A crisis service came in. Oh, I see. I see. I see. But they, but ACS allowed them to come in, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I was trying to get the word out through them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. They could have, they could have said, that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I knew like people came in to be like, oh, you know, there's services if you want to talk to somebody. And the police came in and be like, well, you know, there's ways to protect yourself. Maybe you should carry a weapon. But they literally said, you know, if somebody wants to kill you, there's nothing you can do about it. And they just promoted like buddy systems and things like that when walking to her car like supervisors had to walk people to their cars at night mm -hmm. um i i did that for a while um i know vin talks about in our interview next week that he did that like i don't want to get too far into it because I, I don't want to spoil either. really important things with that i really thought this series would bring me some sort of closure with this i know what what has it brought you i'm just happy that we are able to document what happened and share it with a larger audience so that one, Christian is not forgotten. Two, the ACS is not getting away with what they did because we're letting people know what they did. Yeah. And, you know, I, I worry about, I worry what this is going to bring upon us. I, I don't I, care people, what it brings people, people upon us th if People think bad. that's paranoid, but I, I, we live in a small town. People are going to find out that we did this. People are going to hear this and people aren't, aren't going to like this at all. People are going to be upset with us. And I don't know what that's going to lead to. A lot of you joke that if, as a true crime podcast, we could get killed for doing this. I just want to let you all know. This is the episode. That if we 
are to mysteriously end up dead, if we are mysteriously ended up suicided, that if, if you find out, oh, and Yorgi and Drewby committed suicide, that is never going to happen. There is nothing that would happen that would cause us to commit suicide. I want you to know this. I be, Listen to me right now. There is no reason that we are going to die accidentally or intentionally by our own hand. If that happens, know that something was up. And I hate to be this type of dramatic about it, but really when we're, we, we get a comment about this very frequently, you know, you guys could get killed for being a true crimers. Well, I don't really think that's the case, but here's the one where maybe there's that slight percent. I don't think anyone's really going to kill us, but you know, could people get mad enough? I mean, we usually cover cases that are um, really old here in Maine or they're not in Maine at all, but we live around the people that are going to be upset at us and people could find us. And people could do something. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. I don't regret doing this at all. No. This needed to be done. Nobody's talking about Christiana's case. And furthermore, if you are a true crime podcast or channel, what have you, and you want to cover Christiana's case, we will offer as much transparency as possible. We won't give out anything that we couldn't give out on here, but we will help you in whatever way you want to. If you want to interview us, if you want to just talk to us, you can get your notes in order. We will help you in any way, shape, or form get this out. I don't want this case to be forgotten. So if you're from this other place, or even if you're from here in Maine, and you just want to do your part to get this case out, please, please contact us. And we will do everything in our power to help you get that out. Because I just feel like we had a duty being so close to this. You know, we, we saw the impact of what happened we were around all this. This happened at our place of work. We have the ability to put that information out there so it's not forgotten to time. And so I feel like we have a duty to do that. And furthermore, our duty is not done because if you want to get this out here on your own platform, we have a duty to help you with that. So please let us know. We got a little bit ahead of ourselves talking about ACS, but Alonda also completely vanished from social media found Could, nothing on her. Find her not even a picture i think i found what could be her dad but i don't know if it is 100 percent. i can't find anything anything at all but i know that when you look for people in canada it's not as easy as if you're looking in america america it's very transparent and easy to find people's addresses where they live and we had her home address at the time uh, that uh, is in the affidavit it's in the affidavit yeah but we have no idea where she lives, um, if it's still her name, or even if she's still alive. And same thing with Brandy. I mean, I would assume she's still alive. Yeah. Um, Can't even find anything on Michael, and he'd be an adult now. Yeah. And Buddy and Brandy, I'm assuming, given the situation, have lost all contact. So it's not like we could ask Buddy about it. I know he still speaks with his mother. Yeah. But like, is is his mother going to roll on like their twin kids to one or the no. other? I doubt it. And honestly, I haven't spoke with Buddy in two years now. Two years was the last letter. So that's it. That's all. I'm glad you stuck with us this time if you have. I, this is a really important one. I'm not going to take up too many other people's times, but here's a picture of all of our patrons that are supporting us. We love you very much, especially Levi, our highest tier Patreon supporter. If you appreciate this, please hit like and subscribe. Like, you have no idea how much effort we put into this. We spent so much time on this. It took the, me all summer just to get this together. Like, legitimately, if you could just subscribe, share this with people, share us with people, get us out there. YouTube isn't showing us to non-subscribers lately. We've been looking. It's supposed to be you get showed to more subscribers than you are even your own subscribers. It's the opposite right now. We're not getting put into new feeds. So... We need your help to get us out there. If you could do that for us, it would mean the world to us. It would be the biggest thanks you could do for us. If you want to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the misery machine, you'll get access to all of our secret episodes, our secret chats, our discord, like all those things, you know all about it. Those are ways you can get back to us right now. But until next week. We love you so much. We love you very much. Bye. Bye.